Around the world, global trade is facing a slowdown and a backlash from voters who feel that their interests have been left behind. Uh, as you heard from Brexit to Trump now, trade and globalization face a new uncertainty. What is the cost of international trade on American jobs? How will anti-trade rhetoric play out and what impact will it have on the US economy and businesses? Our next conversation will explore the impact of the president-elect's trade agenda on the American economy. To illuminate this discussion, we are joined by Chairman Fred Hochberg of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Give him a nice welcome there. They Edward Alden, he's a, a Bernard L. Swartz Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and author of the recently published book, Failure to Adjust, How Americans Got Left Behind in the Global Economy. And it is my pleasure to welcome back to the stage the Atlantic's James Fellows. Uh, greetings again. <laughs> nice to see you. Long time no see. I'm really glad. And, and, and our conversation is a natural extension of what we were just talking about with, uh, with, with Peter Orzag. You both know from your respective uh, viewpoints, you know, running the XM Bank and writing about the effects of trade, the way in which, in essence, demonization of trade has been a central part of this campaign. And the emotions of people who feel dislocated by trade have also been, been very central emotion. I'm just going to start with a perspective que uh, setting question. And I'll start with, with you, Ted Alden, of how, how you think as some, how the public should think about the human dislocation costs of trade and the way they had a role in this election. Now, you've written a book yeah. on this topic, which yeah. is great, but, but give us the, the, the brief overview. I mean, it clearly had a big role, yeah. right? I mean, obviously we know technology has probably had a bigger impact in terms of job dislocation, but trade has hit hard in some places. We see it from the research that David Otter at MIT and Gordon yeah. Hansen at UC San Diego and others have done. And if you look at the states that through the election to Trump, you know, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, these were all states very hard hit in the 2000s by import competition, primarily from China. So yeah, it made a big difference, no question. And just to follow up on uh, that before turning to Fred, having been, to a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> having been to a lot of these places myself in the last while, my impression is that all of the recent, or most of the recent job loss is automation, technology, moving from Erie, Pennsylvania to Fort Worth, Texas, not China, not Mexico. Why is it kicking in now? as opposed to 10 years ago or 20 years ago when the real trade-related losses were happening? You know, honestly, I think a lot of it is a delayed impact. I think, I think it takes a while for these things to hit and really affect people's conscience. I think it was, it was worsened by the Great Recession and the financial crisis. So people kind of took a double whammy. There had been a hit there in the 2000s, some of which was import competition, others, as you say, technology. And then, and then the impact of the recession, I think you put that together. A lot of people have had a very hard time getting back on their feet, and they're upset about it. And Peter Arzak said about the workers at the carrier factory that Trump promised these jobs are coming back from Mexico, but Peter Arzak was saying, no, they're not. Are, are they coming back They're certainly not going to come back the way Donald Trump yeah. uh, thinks about it. No, we're not going to go back to the 1960s economy when 25% of our population yeah. worked in manufacturing. But that said, I think there are things we could do in trade policy, and in particularly domestically, in terms of supporting people facing very, very difficult adjustments to make their lives better. And, and, and I hope we will focus on yeah. those. I'm less than optimistic that we will, but I hope we will. So let me ask you now, Fred, how... The role of the Export-Import Bank has been controversial enough that your funding has been essentially paralyzed for, for quite a while, nor, nor the, near the end of your, your tenure. You've heard also the trade packs that you have worked to get through and that, that you have supported being demonized by, by members of all parties. What do you think has happened to the discussion of trade in the United States that has brought us to this past, where it's sort of a universally agreed upon um, evil? Well, I think what Ted said is, I think that manufacturing jobs were in decline, and I agree that the economic, global economic crisis, which some of my foreign counterparts like to call the Lehman crisis, I call it the global financial crisis, uh, I've been correcting them for seven years, I think hastened it. So I think that accelerated a lot of things and jobs were not coming back. I mean, the fact is, in my tenure at the bank, I've been there since the beginning of President Obama's term, we look at the number of jobs supported, say, per billion dollars worth of exports. And when I got there, it was about 72, 7,300 jobs per billion dollars. Today, it's about 6,000. Hmm. So that's, in seven years, that's a 17% improvement in productivity just 
in that export quadrant. Then that's not the whole economy, but it is a large part of the economy that we're just able to, we're doing more manufacturing. We're actually, you know, and I think what you just said about the 50s, in the 1950s, about 5% of our economy was export. Today it's about 12 or 13%. So those quote unquote heyday of the 50s, actually we're doing two and a half times more now, but it's just a lot less people to do so. So I think we're not seeing the job gains from some of that manufacturing because of automation, yeah. it's digitized. There, you know, in the old days, I was in a car factory, you were always afraid of getting a lemon. You know, there are no lemons. <laughs> there are no lemons anymore because the manufacturing process is so engineered, you don't have the variation. So all of those things have had a profound impact and they, there's a cumulative effect. And a related theme in the winning presidential campaign for the past two years has been not simply that manufacturing jobs are going down, but manufacturing is going down, the American economy is terrible, American companies are terrible. From having helped American companies sell around the world, what's the right way to think about the sort of state of U.S. corporate and exporting health now? Well, uh, if you're, you'd rather be in this country than any other place in the world. You know, we may not be happy, as you were talking to the last panel, about the, our growth rate, but frankly, um, no other developed, advanced economy is growing at the rate that we are. Not Japan, not Australia, not Canada, not Europe. So it is not the growth rate we all would like. It's not the kind of growth rate that really lifts the economy and, and helps lift wages as much as we'd like. But we have to look at things relatively, and relatively, it is still better. That's, that doesn't really sell that doesn't elect people to office. You're better off than your counterparts in Europe. That really doesn't matter. But it does help when thoughtful people are just help remind people of where we are relatively. We're in a low, slow growth period than we have been. That said, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that's being put in place around the world from satellite technology, communications, airport, transportation, rail, which we sell and export, which I think people forget, Jim, is we're the second largest exporting nation in the entire world. And we were the largest a dozen years ago. Um, and we're only, the only one that's larger than us is China. So I actually am still an optimist. We could be, again, the largest exporting nation in the world. We have a lot of the innovation and technology. We just need to put ourselves to it. So I'd like to ask you from your respective points of view about a, a newsworthy item of the TPP. Fred, you and I talked about this in China a number of times over the years. And in China, this was, I think, seen as a sort of strategic in, uh, uh, measure against China, more or more or less. Yes. And from, uh, so, so t tell us how you think the TPP should be properly understood as we look probably back on it uh, in the rearview mirror. Well, first of all, just some quick history. You know, when the, uh, we, we don't call them free trade agreements anymore because that's a bad word. So we call it TPP, and part of the problem is research shows 70% of people have no idea what TPP is. Yeah. Um, so one, people don't fully understand it. Two, when, we, when NAFTA was done in the 90s, there were perhaps a dozen free trade agreements globally, perhaps a dozen. Today, there are more than 600. So we are ahead of the pack, and we're now getting sidelined. So we have to, under, you know, part of this understanding the context we're in Right now, there are free trade agreements all over the place, and we have a choice. We're going to have to, you know, politics is, is choosing what's possible. It's not what's ideal. So that is a challenge we're going to have to face as a country, how we deal with that, because we are getting somewhat sidelined. And China, uh, I've been in China. We've talked about it. Uh, China is probably thrilled that C TPP was sidelined. They have something called RECEP. And it's interesting what the term means, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Recep. It's with China and 10, 12 countries in Southeast Asia, many of the same countries as TPP. So they, they will fill that vacuum yeah. very, very quickly. This is a boon to China. Yeah. So Ted, I'll ask you from your perspective, the last chapter of your excellent book, Failure to Adjust, you talk about the TPP and other ways, other kinds of trade agreements. Tell us whether TPP was presented during the campaign as one more millstone around the neck of American workers and consumers. 
Was that a correct way to portray it? And what's the right way in trade agreements to advance the interest of the people left behind? Well, I, I mean, I want to—I do not want to leave this audience with an incorrect impression, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is dead, yep. and the issue in the next administration is not going to be do we go forward with sure. TPP or do we go forward? With, it's going to be how much do we roll things back? Yep. What happens? Do we impose tariffs on Mexico? Do we impose tariffs on China? So we are moving into a very different era. Mm -hmm. Um, U.S. administrations for the last 70 years have believed that global trade was a win-win. It was good for American companies, good for Americans, good for the world. This administration does not believe that. The coming administration, it sees trade as very much zero sum. In my book, I argue that, that we've got to get away from black and white thinking here. I think trade agreements have not done everything for American workers that they were supposed to. I think they've hurt some American workers. I think um, we've lost our competitive edge in some place. I think shutting down the Export-Import Bank was one of the dumbest ideas yeah. ever because that's an agency that's actually helping us sell products in the world. We actually have to think strategically both how to compete in the global economy and about a, how to help Americans adjust, acquire the skills, be able to prosper in that economy. We've never done that effectively as a nation, and I think we're about to pay the, the price for that. So um, I, I think killing TPP is a bad idea. I think TPP actually gives us some advantages, but, but it's the inevitable result when you actually do not pay attention to the frictions that have been created by globalization, and that's what we've done as a country. So take us through, if you say we're going to see in the next year, the next administration, more tariffs, more um, movement in the, the opposite direction, these free trade uh, perspective, what will that mean in specific for the people to whom Donald Trump made his most urgent appeal, his most fervent appeal. You know, you've yeah. been, the, the carrier plant workers, yeah. others, take us through what this will mean. Well, I mean, I, I don't think it will mean good things for them. So if he, you know, if he carries out the, the full agenda that he's talked about, you know, 45% yeah. tariffs on Chinese imports, 30% on Mexico, et cetera. I mean, the Peterson Institute came out with a study a few months ago um, that suggested that'll drive the economy into a recession. We're going to lose several million jobs. You're not going to, you're not going to drag manufacturing jobs back by imposing tariffs, it, particularly in manufacturing. We live in a world of global supply chains. I mean, the, the, the U.S. auto industry, which has been doing quite well in recent years, is fully integrated in North America, in Canada and Mexico. You start trying to lop off one part of that by saying, well, we're not going to import parts or vehicles from Mexico. You're going to blow up the whole auto industry supply chain, and that's going to cost jobs in Michigan and Ohio and other places. I think the ends are, are, are legitimate ones. We've got to think more strategically about strengthening our manufacturing economy. The, you know, the reason that the loss of manufacturing jobs was such a, a, a difficult thing for this country was those were jobs that, in effect, raised everybody else up. These were unionized jobs that people at moderate skill levels could get paid very good wages. The unions have been crushed, and a lot of those jobs have disappeared. And we have not filled that hole in our economy. And I think that's where a lot of the anger comes from. And I'm a believer in, in, in a strong manufacturing policy, but, but blocking imports through tariffs is going to have exactly the opposite effect. Peter Orzag was making the point that with every passing day in which a new administration is not sort of equipped for battle, the congressional Republican faction becomes more and more important in determining future policy. What does that mean as you think of what's going to happen for trade policies in the next year? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think on, you know, in terms of going forward, I think it means a stalemate. There are congressional Republicans like, you know, Kevin Brady, the, mm -hmm. the, the Ways and Means chairman, who would like to go forward. But that's not going to happen, I think, under a Trump administration. The, the bigger problem, in a way, is what we've had on trade is this tiny vector, okay? We've had Republicans who favored free trade because the corporations wanted it. We've had Democrats who really wanted strong social safety programs. They wanted retraining. They wanted investment in infrastructure. Republicans didn't want that. The only place they've been able to come together is in pursuing trade agreements because Democratic presidents, largely for foreign policy reasons, you look at President Clinton, President Obama, want to have that tool. And that's the only place they've been able to come together. But that's not happening anymore. So I think really a lot of this is up in the air. You could see strange alliances on infrastructure between the Republicans and the Democrats. On trade, I think the best case scenario is that we don't move backwards very rapidly. I think moving forward on trade liberalization is highly, highly unlikely. And, and Fred, you've had a lot of experience with the Congress over the recent years. What's your expectation of what a congressionally driven trade policy well, means Well, first of all, year? we need something besides sanctions. Otherwise, we're left yeah. with sanctions. Sanctions are not a terribly effective trade policy. And sanctions really get our allies very angry because we're the only country that really can get away with sanctions and not be badly hurt. So when we, you know, when it comes to Russia, we can impose sanctions. It doesn't really impact our economy. It really hurts Germany and other places yeah. like that. So 
we have got to have a, a better conversation about, okay, if not a trade agreement, we're going to have sanctions, and unless we get the Exim Bank fully operational, we really have very few tools to really help American workers get their fair share of export sales. And I think we haven't connected those dots yet, number one. Number two, I think we haven't really been very creative and imaginative on what to do about workers who are displaced. And that's a very tough, yeah. tricky thing to do because some workers will, are displaced because of technology. You know, if you worked in a Hummer factory, um, they probably, the, the tastes have changed and people aren't buying Hummers. So how you separate um, market failures, technology, and actual trade is not simple to do to say, okay, where do we, who do we really find a way to supplement and help in some fashion? The TAA we have, the um, Trade, trade Adjustment, adjustment assistance. assistance, is very complicated, yeah. hard to qualify for, and really not, as one labor person told me, all it is is a gold-plated casket. That's how one labor leader described it to me. Can, yes. I, can I throw in yes. a factoid on this? Yeah. Okay, so uh, active labor market programs is what they're called. So, so these are programs to help people move from one career to the next, from one job to the next, to help them make that transition. We in the United States spend 0.1% of our GDP on these programs. Denmark spends 2% of its GDP on these programs. The 34 countries in the OECD, the club of wealthy countries, we spend less than every other country except Mexico and Chile. The only other wealthy country, and, and I think this is not coincidental, that spends almost as little as we do is the United Kingdom, and they're pulling themselves out of the European Union. I think countries that do not pay attention to the impacts of globalization on their workforce are paying the price, and we're seeing it this year. And just to follow up, in those programs that, to which the Danes and others are investing so much more money, do they actually work? They have worked reasonably yeah. well in Europe. They worked a lot better. In, I mean, you look at Germany. So, so you know, if you look at export totals, and, and I agree with Fred, I don't think the U.S. performance is terrible, but, but you know, the U.S. share of global exports has dropped dramatically in the last 15 years. Uh, Chinese share has gone way yeah. up. The German share has remained essentially flat. They have developed apprenticeship programs. They have worker retraining programs. Almost 20% of their workforce is still in manufacturing. So they really do a much better job of this than the United States does, even if, I agree with Fred, overall our economic picture is a little better in terms of growth. I have a hypothesis to, add, to present to both of you, and you can tell me where I'm wrong about it. Long, long ago when I was in college, I did a big dissertation on economic dislocation in the United States in the 1840s and 1850s. Mm -hmm. And one of the conclusions from that was that if your job and your industry uh, disappears when you're below age 30, you're able to do something else. If you're over age 40 or 45, you know, even back then or now, let's say 50 or 55, you really don't ever adjust. They're just, you know, there, there are life cycle cruelties. That's how things are. I say this as a, as a senior member of the journalism business, et cetera. Uh, so, so it's the, 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 no, the, the Atlantic is doing really well. But thank you all for, for coming, coming here. The, so, so the question is, is it, um, is it illusory to suggest to people who've worked in a factory for 20 years and the factory goes away that they will ever be able to find something that is comparable to what they used to have? Um, I, I think the answer, and I'll let Fred wait if he wants to, I think the answer is yes. And I think that's why you need to look at more than just retraining programs. So my colleague Bob Lighton and I have argued, I mean, Bob's argued this going back in the mid-80s, for a program of wage insurance where if people yep. get lower wage jobs, we're just gonna top up their wages. Yes. Um, you look at expansion of the earned income tax credit, and you can say, well, isn't that expensive for taxpayers? Well, this research that David Otter and Gordon Hansen did, looking at these trade exposed communities, what happened to these workers, these 45 plus men? They're all on social security disability mm -hmm. now. They found some doctor yeah. to vouch that they have an injury right. or something that prevents them from going back to work. So they are basically on lifetime welfare. They're never going back into the labor force. It would be a lot cheaper for us right. to do these other programs that we don't do. Uh, Fred. I think we also have to get to a point that I, I agree exactly with your hypothesis. And one of the differences between the 19th century and this century, it was much more gradual. So people had yeah, more right. ability to adjust. Here, whether, you know, I talked to people whether driverless cars, for example, or whether they're gonna be here in five years or 10 years, we're arguing over five years. Mm -hmm. We're not arguing over five years or 50 years. So we have to figure out adjustments, and we also have to, all of us have to understand, it's not a problem in this room, but doing the same job you did and doing it for 20 years is not a guarantee that every year you'll get a nice increase and increased benefits and a larger bonus, unless there's, you're increasing your skill level 
or the productivity is going up, there is no money. And we, we don't want to have that. That's a, I, I agree. That's a very ugly conversation. But we've sort of, I think we've misled people by saying, well, if you just keep this job, pay your dues, you're a union member, a non-union member, and you do this year after year, you'll keep making more money and everything will just be fine. And you're right, people under 30 know that's not the case. People yeah. 45 are our age, Jim. Uh, it's different, but if you, and I don't think we've really put that in front of the American people in any way that, just, that, that they understand that when they take that job yeah. at a, at a and there's, and there's yeah. just quickly, there's more coming, yeah. right? There are three and a half million truck drivers in this country who, who yeah. you know, fit the demographic of, of the old manufacturing workers, older men mostly. You know, when driverless technology well, hits, a lot of yeah. jobs are going to disappear. Yeah. And, and they're all yeah. men. Yeah. And they're mostly men. They're yeah. virtually yeah. all virtually men. men. Yeah. Yeah. And just to close the loop here, in, in recent uh, visits to Erie, Pennsylvania, my wife and I have seen a sharp contrast. People who are in their 50s and 60s were used to working at the GE locomotive plant. People in their late 20s and 30s never expected to work there and actually creating new businesses in Erie and elsewhere, and I think that is, is, is a generational shift. Mm -hmm. There's lots of countries we could talk about, but I want to ask you about one, which is the biggest one, China. Um, Fred, tell us from your many dealings with China over the last eight years, is the U.S. getting better positioned, worse positioned with the uh, threatened um, uh, tariffs or currency uh, sanctions against China? Would they make any difference? Tell us how we should think about trade with China right now. God, that's a complicated subject. <laughs> that, that's why you're the expert. That's why I'm the expert. Yeah. Um, I think, obviously, TPP, the lack of that, certainly handicaps us. I think that U.S. companies have a tough time in China. Uh, you know, They've often said, just give me a level playing field, but if, if I can't compete against a state-owned enterprise, which is a large yeah. part of the Chinese economy, I'm really not being able to get my fair share of sales there. So I think that's a very tough environment. Um, I'm not a China scholar like you are, Jim, but obviously Xi Jinping is a very kind of nationalist kind of leader. So I think that's going to make it harder for foreign companies to operate in there. I think obviously the new president coming in, pre President-elect Trump, what that posture is going to be with China will have an impact. Um, the way we treat other countries, the, impacts very much how those countries treat our companies. Yeah. There's a direct correlation to that. So uh, our companies frequently pay the brunt or on the front line of dealing with both either a, our friendly relationships or our unfriendly relationships. They feel it first. Yeah. As it happens, I have a cover story in The Atlantic that came out today on exactly this topic. So um, when you're done here, uh, I recommend that reading. Ted, how do you think about China and its role in the dislocations you described? Yeah. And, I, and I, would, I would highly recommend the article, by the way. It really does talk uh, about some significant changes in China. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard him on uh, NPR last night, so I got to jump on it. Um, I, I think China, unfortunately, you know, if you, if you want to ask why we're here at this moment, I think a lot of it has to do with China's admission into the World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. which I supported, which I think was inevitable. But China was so big that it has proved to be enormously disruptive for the trading system. I mean, in particular, we know China subsidizes its companies very heavily. It discriminates on the basis of technology yeah. and regulations. And These are all areas in which, yeah. in which WTO rules yeah. have really not proved to be yeah. that effective. WTO rules are great if you slap a discriminant or tariff or quota. You can challenge those. They're kind of easy to prove. All these subtle areas are harder to go after. And, and I think as a result, you know, we have seen a lot of damage in certain areas. It's been difficult. Uh, for the U.S. government, even using the tools of WTO dispute settlement to go after it. You know, it's not coincidental to me that Trump's top trade advisors all come out of the steel industry. You know, China's <laughs> steel industry is subsidized up the wazoo. It's grown yeah. tenfold right. in the last 15 years, and it's displaced steel companies all over the world. You know, that level of trade distortion, I think, has unfortunately been quite damaging. And we're going to have to find some way to constrain it without blowing up all the positive elements of the <coughs> U.S.-China trade we relationship, be, which are there are many. Right? too anxious to get yeah. into the WTO without putting the enforcement mm -hmm. in. I, I think there's And one of the that. problems with WTO, yeah. from my understanding, you need a company to actually commence the lawsuit. Yeah. And many companies don't want to commence a lawsuit with China because they have business yeah, in China. Business interest in China. So yeah. that makes that, yeah. it's a tool, but it's a difficult to use. Yeah. And as a sign of the spot that China itself is in, 
in this same year when they're exporting steel at a huge subsidy, they're expected to lose between one and two million steel and coal jobs this year yeah. within China, so that yeah. they are, are in, in trouble themselves too. Does either of you want to say anything about Peter Navarro, who seems to be uh, Donald Trump's um, China expert and economic advisor? I mean, I, I don't know Peter personally. I don't know a great deal about his work. I, I would comment generally that Trump's advisory team is tremendously thin. You know, I mean, a lot of the Republican establishment, the folks I know in Washington who would normally be going into a Republican administration have effectively recused themselves by right. signing on to these never Trump letters. And Trump pretty clearly doesn't want to hire any of these people. So, so you know, I, as I say, I look around on trade. He's got Dan D'Amico, the former CEO of Nucor. He's got Wilbur Ross, the, the vulture fund investor. These are kind of guys who came out of the steel industry. I'm not sure you got anybody there who understands the tech industry or agriculture right. or all the other parts of our trading economy. And that worries me a lot. I have a philosophical question for each of you, <clears throat> which will be my last question, then we'll go to the audience. I'm going to start with you, Fred. You're nearing the end of eight years in governance in a really important role that's taken you all around the world, and you're <clears throat> nearing the, the end of that time when uh, the cause you've been working for, that is trade, is being, uh, is being demonized, when people think that you know, just the federal government is an enemy and a blight. How should people, is it possible for people to think differently about the role of federal governance now than they do? Well, speaking as somebody, you know, leaving eight years doing this, how should we think about federal governance now? Well, I think that's, you know, we've done a lot, our country has done a lot to discredit government for a long time. You know, sometimes when we talk about infrastructure, we say, well, if it's, it used to be called public works, by the way. Remember, it was, remember it was called public works? Who remembers public works? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but now we think, well, if the government does it, they'll waste money, it'll take forever. And then if we say, well, let's let the private sector open this through, and they go, oh, but then they'll rip us off. So we don't really want the private sector to do it, we don't want the public sector to do it. I think that, so I think that we've got some rebuilding. I, I, on, on the area that I spend a lot of time on in terms of exports, people may not like trade, but they like exports, <laughs> which is a little tricky. Um, <laughs> we just want to sell, we never want to buy. Um, for business leaders here, I think one of the failures of the business community, I will call it a failure, is they have not educated their workers about the benefits of exports and trade. They have, you know, so people see it as an enemy, but still, a, I was in a small factory in Jackson, Mississippi, 80 employees, and in the, in the lunchroom were about 60 or 70 flags from around the world. And it was, they put up a flag whenever they made a sale to that country. And that week I was there, about 35% of the production was going to Saudi Arabia. And everybody in that factory knows that's who paid our salary this week. So Boeing, you go into the Boeing factory, and the first thing painted are the tail fins. So you walk yeah. in, you see Lufthansa, Air Berlin, Air France, Air India, China Air, and so forth. And say, okay, that's who bought our planes. <laughs> yeah. Now, companies, it's one thing for the CEO and the government affairs person to go and meet with Paul Ryan and members of Congress. We have to get people who actually are livelihood is dependent on trade, dependent on export, to be engaged. And I think the business community has not really put that effort in. And just really quickly, you know, I think it would be very interesting. You know, for the last 30, 40 years, whatever, we've heard from the people who've been hurt by the march of trade liberalization. If we see a Trump administration starting to slap tariffs on imports and countries retaliate on ours, we're going to hear from all the people whose jobs in this country depend on trade. So there, there could be a very different dynamic. I was in Wyoming the, right after the election talking with somebody who was a very big um, Trump supporter, but then was thinking he hopes that with, this didn't hurt the market in Mexico for his products. So, <laughs> Good example. See, so, <laughs> so, well, uh, I, Jim, I was in Utah, and the, on TPP, the farmers there are outraged. They said, we need to sell our beef to New Zealand and yeah. Australia, and, and Japan. This is, you know, yeah. who's going to help us do that right now? So my, my philosophical question for you, Ted, is that I posit this is the second gilded age. Everything that's wrong with the economy and culture now, we <clears> see <throat> the precedence of an 1880s, 1890s, dislocation from, te from technology, from, from trade and all the rest. Bear with me in this yeah, hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there, we know looking back, there was a time through union rights or other ways that sort of the distribution of income went back mm -hmm. up again, the extremes were, were brought back towards the center. What is your view on when the polarization and disruption of this second Gilded Age will be 
uh, redressed, corrected, brought back. You know, to I do not have a crystal ball, but I agree with your analysis. I think we're in a period that looks an awful lot like the 1920s yeah. and 1930s. I also work on immigration a lot, mm -hmm. and we're about to see yeah. a major backlash against immigration through this new administration. And I think we're going to see a level of economic nationalism and restrictionism that we have not seen in this country in yeah. close to a century. And how long that will take to play? It could be people tire of it really quickly. You know, it could be people look at the consequences and they say, whoa, you know, we learned this lesson once, we better learn it again. But I, I don't know how long yeah. it'll take to play out. Yeah. <laughs> I would just add, well, I think one of the frustrations with politics right now is it's, politics is by its nature is slow. It means talking to people, getting buy-in, pulling a lot of people in. We live in an instant age, a Twitter age, and so I think there's a greater dislocation between the process of governing and the way communication yeah. moves. So to that end, perhaps this Gilded Age may come, the change oh. may come faster. That, that's good, I'm gonna tweet that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for a question on this side of the room, who has a question, raise a hand, wait for a microphone. Uh, yes, uh, woman, they, yes, yes, please. And so a microphone is coming, so wait. And just, leopard skin. Yes, and leopard skin. <laughs> Leopard skin and glasses, yes. Okay, hi, Wendy Gold. Can you make a comment on the next wave that's gonna come from artificial intelligence? We've spoken about technology, um, which has impacted labor. What's gonna happen with artificial intelligence? Yes. Can I just, I'll recommend a book, because there, there's a, a book by my it's friend Vivek smart. Wadwa called Driver in the Driverless Car, which is coming out in a couple of months. Um, I saw it as an excellent chapter on artificial intelligence, robotics, the whole next wave, a lot of things are gonna change. And, and I think we need to learn the lessons from our mistakes in the era of globalization so that we're better able to deal with all the people who are gonna lose jobs as a result of, of the coming technology innovations. So I highly recommend his work. Uh, yes, in the front row here. And so wait for a microphone. Uh, I'm disproportionately calling in the front row because that's about as far as I can see with the lights. <laughs> but it's bright. Yes. Uh, Thank you, I'm uh, Rob Colarina. I'm, I'm with an investment group. Um, first, uh, I guess, observation on the tech side. I think uh, Teal's uh, position, cho choice to the transition um, side, I think that speaks in volumes on the tech. But my question is with respect to, I guess, the labor side. Um, I think the American labor side is, is pretty sophisticated. I think they recognize jobs were sort of a, a, a promise during the campaign. There's gonna be some correction. With that said, how do the various states either um, compete together or compete separately Forward, uh, towards attention by this administration, just given some of the other priorities. And, and that's related to things you discuss in your book, sort of a competition among states, et cetera. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, just, just quickly, I, I argue in my book, uh, you know, and Jim, some of your work has been about all the interesting things happening at state and local levels. I kind of argue a better role for the federal government is to get behind the states in yeah. some of these things. If you're a state trying to build a solar panel industry, for instance, what the federal government does in trade policy matters for you. Yeah. And so if states are trying to attract us, I argue the federal government should be helping in various ways and playing a supporting role. So I hope that's where we'll go. Uh, states are largely in the Elected in U.S. trade policy. I think that's a real mistake. Yeah, there's a mic over there. Yes. Hi. Hi, Gloria Brown Marshall. Um, I'm, I wanted to kind of touch on how does diversity and the, the sense that the Trump administration has um, tied uh, counter to the, um, uh, the, the gay community, people of color, et cetera, since that's now a global issue as well. And we saw that with the Olympics and other ways that the pressures that we want to put on other countries to be more inclusive, and yet our, our government looks like it's backtracking. How does that generally or indirectly affect um, trade, et cetera? I, I have my own answer to that, then I'm gonna to turn to you, Fred, which is that I've spent a lot of my life living outside the United States. What makes me feel proudest of being an American is precisely its diversity, precisely that Olympic team, precisely that we are a place where people from, a, we can get an outside share of the world's talent because everybody can feel that he, has, he or she has a chance to do things. And so I am heart sick by the thrust of recent politics that is to me the rejection of everything that I love about this country. So I am sorry to see that and I, I Fred, what is your view on this? Well, I think some of what we've seen is a little bit of a, a last-ditch stand. And so I think that the diversity is here. Uh, none of us can move to Europe and be French or German, no matter what we do. We can be there for 50 years. We can never. Someone from there moves to our country, and they're an American. Yeah. Uh, my mother came here at age 10. And uh, I thought about, when you mentioned this, I thought about the whole controversy about... Um, the quote-unquote Mexican-American judge yeah. who was born in Indiana. 
If you called my mother German American, she would have hit you. <laughs> and if you called me German American, because my mother's born in Germany, I would look at you. What are you talking about? So, but partly that genie's out, and we're, it's always it's we've always had pressure of trying to push it back, but that is that is the way, that is who we are. It is our greatest strength. Um, so I'm I'm concerned, but it's going to be it's very hard to push that back. The other thing I would say when we talk about manufacturing jobs, one of the things that worries me. We should be talking about jobs that, that really benefit both genders, and too many of the manufacturing jobs. I, every time I go into a factory, I ask, well, what's the gender makeup in here, and how much do you pay? And there are more and more, that's the advantage, because less and less manufacturing jobs about lifting heavy things, yeah. but are really operating computers on the floor. Yeah. But yeah. I want to talk about manufacturing jobs, but make sure it's also gender neutral, that we're not just worrying about men drivers and men in factories, that's really not the way to have a good industrial Okay, a final word from you. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. I mean, the <laughs> next four years are going to be a wild ride. <laughs> okay, again, we, we've, we have unfortunately reached the end of our time. Please join me in thanking Fred Hockbird and Ted Alden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.